right, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from uh, around the world. Uh, my name is Vincent Morrow. Uh, I'm the wine director at Press Restaurant in St. Helena, uh, just about a quarter mile down the road from Louis Martini uh, Winery in St. Helena, California, where we're uh, broadcasting from. Uh, we do have a live studio audience with us today, and thank you to everyone uh, who's joining uh, virtually from around the world. Uh, so this morning, we're kicking off the uh, 26th uh, anniversary of Premier Napa Valley. Um, and that certainly comes with an asterisk, as I know the past uh, two years for many of us has been extremely challenging. So um, this year uh, for this panel, we're, uh, we're operating in a, in a dual format where we have uh, in-person as well as a virtual attendance. Uh, this morning, we have uh, four panelists that I'm incredibly honored and excited uh, to have to discuss uh, a vintage perspective panel. Now, this is, has always been a part of Premier Napa Valley where we look at a specific uh, age range or decade uh, in terms of wines to uh, discuss how they're developing, uh, what their ability is to age, and why that is the case. Uh, so today, we'll be looking at the 2000s decade, ranging from the 2001 vintage to the 2010 vintage. Uh, collectively with our four panelists today, we have over a hundred years of winemaking experience here uh, in Napa Valley. So I'm incredibly excited and humbled to uh, introduce our four panelists this morning. Uh, the first is Bruce Cakebread, who undoubtedly has one of the longest tenures here in Napa Valley, who began in the late seventies and is still at the helm of Cakebread Cellars uh, here in the Napa Valley. Our next panelist following that is uh, Sam Baxter, who is the owner and winemaker at Terra Valentine Winery, uh, high atop uh, the Spring Mountain District in the northwestern section of the valley. Uh, following that is Michael Eddy, who is at the helm of the winemaking here at Louis and Martini, where we're broadcasting from uh, only the fourth winemaker and a long lineage of uh, Martini family winemakers, but the first to not be a part of the family. Um, uh, at least in terms of blood. So excited to uh, dive into what that experience has been like for Michael. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Elizabeth Viana, who is the general manager and winemaker at Chimney Rock Winery uh, in the Stag's Leap District. Uh, Elizabeth uh, focusing around single vineyard Cabernets within uh, one subregion of Napa. So excited to discuss the uh, uh, ability of a specific region. Uh, to age over that course of a time period. Uh, before we jump into uh, the broader discussion, I feel it appropriate to address uh, the four very delicious wines that myself uh, and our in-person audience has here in the room. And right off the bat, we're going to jump right in with uh, Bruce Cakebread of Cakebread Cellars. Uh, so Bruce, we're, we have your 2004 uh, Dancing Bear Cabernet in front of us, but I'd like to just backtrack a little bit and have you talk to us a little bit about uh, Cake Bread Cellars, uh, your involvement there over the past 45 years, give or take, uh, what your role and responsibilities were when you entered and where they're at now and, uh, and how we came to be today. So Bruce, you have the, you have the floor, sir. After we take you off mute, if you don't mind. The world we live in. And there we go. A couple more years of pandemic and I'll get it right. So <laughs> a, anyway, thank you very much, Vincent, uh, for hosting the panel. And it should be exciting taste, tasting with uh, the rest of the panel. It should be really fun to uh, uh, tasting coming up. A little bit of background about Cake Bread Cellars is my father and mother started it back in 1973. Uh, we're located right here in Rutherford, right on Highway 29. Uh, we started out with about four barrels of Chardonnay in 73 and added Cabernet in 74, Sauvignon Blanc in 76. Uh, I started working with uh, my father back in 1977 when I was going to UC Davis and Vitneology. Uh, and kind of working nights and weekends. Uh, my grandfather started auto repair in downtown Oakland. And so my father was working with him uh, coming up and uh, we're kind of uh, working that way and got out in 78, uh, took over winemaking and grape growing, which wasn't that big at the time. We were making about 20 barrels. Uh, 
in the mid 80s, my uh, middle brother Dennis came on board uh, working with my father in sales and marketing and I continued on to winemaking until 2002 when uh, I got to short straw in the family business and got moved up to president. And my assistant winemaker at the time, Julianne Lax, she'd been with us for about 16 years as my assistant. She uh, moved up to winemaker uh, in 2002 and did that <clears throat> all the way until 2017 when she retired. And uh, Stephanie Jacobs is our current winemaker. So just like Martini, we've only had uh, four winemakers, my father, myself, Julianne, and now Stephanie over the 50 years. Uh, this wine that we're having is our Dancing Bear Ranch from Aha Mountain. It's uh, 1,600 to 2,200 uh, feet elevation. Uh, very, very rocky site. It was our first hillside vineyard. Today, we have about 225 acres uh, out of three different vineyards on the, that uh, Vaca range on the eastern side of Napa Valley. Uh, very, very rocky site. Um, and this is the third vintage. We bought the property in 2000, 2002 as our first crop. And so this was still bottled under a kind of an informal, uh, what we called a lab label at the time. We really liked the wines, but the, also they were young vines. And so we just wanted to kind of see how this vineyard would progress. And we think it's uh, aging quite nicely. Um, and so it's been exciting um, kind of adventure. Now the vineyard's about 22 years old and uh, just seeing that really kind of for us really proved that site matters in terms of making a great vintage. So that's, that's our short history for us. Oh, that's, that's quite the history and I'm sure we could um... Uh, uh, we could we could talk all day and run a whole uh, panel just on on your tenor and your thoughts uh, on the valley, which well I think we'll skim across that a little bit later. Um, but I, I want to ask you about 2004 specifically and how the vintage was uh, in your opinion um, across all the vineyards that you're working with and how both 2004 as well as uh, the How Mountain. Uh, Appalachian might contribute to the ability of these wines to age over time because you know this wine's in a beautiful place right now. Mm -hmm. yeah, what's interesting with the 2004 vintage, it was uh, uh, our second earliest vintage so far. You know, our earliest vintage was back in 1981. We picked this fruit starting September 6, going through the middle of September. So the very early fast harvest for us, you know, we had a, a, a what I call a hot spell, pretty, you know, it was one of the first uh, extreme hot spells that we kind of worked through. And I always look at vintages kind of, you know, mother nature kind of teaching us a lesson and, you know, what can you take away from it? And 2004 really kicked in for us uh, to move to all night harvest picking. Before that, over the last five years, we'd been dabbling in it when everyone wanted to wake up early, quite, quite frankly, to uh, start picking at night. But 2004, kind of, we kicked in full bore uh, with whites and reds, uh, you know, starting at midnight and picking through till sunrise. And that is, that was kind of one of the learning lessons. And then the other thing, kind of, uh, in the early days, you started seeing dehydration, you picked, uh, you know, and so that was the, one of the factors. With the advent of sorting, whether it's optical sorting or just sorting tables, it really allowed the winemaker to uh, not worry about dehydration, but make sure you get the fruit ripe and you could solve, you could adapt uh, any dehydration uh, factors with, uh, you know, optical sorting. And so I think that is a big, big tool kind of going forward, especially with the 04 harvest of how to adapt to uh, these kind of hot spells and not forcing the winemaker's hand to pick because it's hot because you could run through it and still be able to take out all the uh, the dehydrated fruit. And I think that is a big, big factor in terms of technology, just taking something really simple of uh, destemming and, you know, sorting. And with that technology, optical sorting has been been a, a really a, a godsend in that regard. Bruce, that's, uh, that's in incredibly uh, interesting, and I'm glad you, you touched on that. And um, I just want to quickly have you expand on uh, night harvesting, because, you know, when I leave the restaurant in August and September and October now, and I drive south down Highway 29, it seems like everyone's doing that. Um, but you're, I think you're alluding to, you know, the fact that that wasn't always the case. 
Can you just briefly expand on the benefits of night harvesting beyond dehydration and the help in the sorting process um, before it's, we move on? To me, night harvesting, there's a lot of different wins there. So you just start out with the picking crews. Uh, they like it because they're able to pick longer during the day instead of starting at sunrise and picking till it gets hot. And in this hot spell in 2004, it was you know starting at 9, 30, 10 o'clock. So they're only picking about four hours. Here they could get eight hours worth of picking and be able to lot, make a lot more money per day. So the picking crews liked it and also they're not working in the heat of the day. A lot easier on them. Second thing, it sounds odd, but this is a Napa Valley issue is the trucks weren't stuck in uh, morning traffic. Uh, you know, uh, so that we can get our trucks in, you know, between four and five o'clock in the morning. So this is good. And then you're going to chill the fruit down anyway. And so instead of paying PG&E or utility company to chill our fruit down, Mother Nature was doing it to chilling the fruit down for free. And so uh, re reduced uh, how much energy we're using and just the impacts on wine quality, whether it's whites for in terms of ageability, and keeping freshness or you know your red so that uh, it keeps your sugars down and so it's the analogy i use if you take an apple cut it in half put one out in the sun and one in the, one, one half in the refrigerator what's going to taste better at the end of the day and so it's the one that's fresher and so it's you know a lot of different winds on a lot of different levels but really the wine quality we we saw is kind of a big shift and so we start you know we get all the crews kind of lined up we do our leafing in the afternoon the the morning or the afternoon before, do any uh, you know fruit thinning that we need to do, taking any ugly clusters off, so that the crews can just go through and pick that that night, and then they'll start up about midnight, and then be able to work through until about seven or eight o'clock, depends how much we're picking that day. So it's it's a good thing. Yeah, uh, uh, undoubtedly, and um, I'm really glad that you touched on the labor component because I feel like that's um, something that that we romanticize wine and the and you know everything that goes into producing a, a great bottle, uh, but oftentimes I think perhaps on the consumer side there's not as much uh, awareness surrounding uh, labor. But again, perhaps a, a topic for another day. Uh, I want to um, move on to uh, Sam. Uh, Sam, really excited to uh, have you today in your your 2007 uh, Everton Vineyard bottling. Um, I mean, you. Uh, I think that's a great segue coming from Bruce because you also worked with, uh, worked with your father uh, at Terra Valentine. So, can you just give us a little bit of your background um, at Terra Valentine um, and and what your responsibility and role is today, and then talk us through your uh, uh, through the wine you have for us today. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Vincent, for for hosting, and um, thanks uh, for everyone uh, tuning in this morning. Um, I started at, at Terra Valentine in 1999 uh, after graduating from UC Davis. And uh, at the time, my dad was the, hired as the consulting winemaker. Uh, the winery was started by a couple from Minnesota, Angus and Margaret Wordle. And so I was kind of, I was pretty, um, you know, green. I'd worked, uh, grown up in, in St. Helena in Napa Valley and, uh, you know, in, uh, in a winemaking family. I'd certainly been working in a lot of wineries throughout my, my life. Um, you know, all the uh, unglorious jobs like bottling line, and, uh, you know, out in uh, the hard labor of the vineyard and everything else. But, um, you know, at starting up at Terra Valentine, it was great to, um, you know, move up uh, the, the mountains above, right above St. Helena and start working with mountain fruit, something that has always captivated me. And uh, especially being able to kind of work with my, my dad. So, you know, as a high schooler, you know, he would bring wines home and I would sit around and, you know, work on the on the blends with him and kind of learn that art of blending. And uh, so then kind of to take that into a real practical uh, mode up at uh, Terra Valentine uh, was, was really a great opportunity. And uh, it was really an interesting few vintages starting in 99 and, and progressing through to 2007. Um, it was a you know, very interesting time in the wine business, a lot of uh, you know, shifting in, in modernization of, uh, like Bruce was mentioning, a lot of the, the processes along the way. And, you know, for me growing up drinking my, the wines that my dad made in Napa in the 70s and 80s, you know, my palate was definitely kind of tied to that kind of more classic style. And, you know, learning to blend from him was really about the components of, you know, balance and elegance and, um, and you know, subtlety in, in the winemaking process. And um, so being able to apply that at Terra Valentine was a lot of fun. I, I then um, 
you know, in 2002, took over the winemaking from my dad and in 2003, took over as general manager as well. So then I ran the company for the Wordle family up there um, at the old Everton on uh, winery, which was built back in the in the late 60s, early 70s. And um, so it's kind of an interesting historic uh, kind of modern ghost winery, so to speak. So we um, you know, planted this vineyard, replanted it actually in 2001. And so uh, the 07 was was still fairly young vines, in fact, to kind of the the awkward teenage years, so to speak, with that vineyard. And um, but I think, uh, you know, our farming was all in house and uh, we were able to really capture the, the essence of that site up there. It's a slightly cooler location being up at the top of the mountain. Um, so that was pretty exciting in 07. So, move, you know, flashing forward just, uh, you know, briefly in 2014, uh, the Wordle family decided to uh, exit the wine business and they sold that property. Uh, and then I, they sold the company, Tara Valentine, and the brand to me. So I became the owner and winemaker in 2014. And we bought a property about a year later, just up at the top of Spring Mountain Road, uh, just over the county line into the Sonoma side of Spring Mountain. So kind of right up at the top of the Mayakama. But still, I work with a lot of fruit from various vineyards up on, on Spring Mountain. Uh I, I, I love that. And, uh, you know, without uh, uh, focusing too much uh, on your father, I think um, uh, he's, he's definitely made some, some incredible wines. And I still uh, think about like, uh, like the old Rutherford Hills uh, before Jerry Looper started and just how um, incredible those have, have developed over time. Um, but certainly uh, uh, the, the, the conversation focused around uh, this decade. Um, before we move on, can you talk to us a little bit about you know, working with mountain fruit um, on the opposite mountain range uh, from Bruce, it's almost as if you go directly west and uh, you're at your vineyard. How does that really contribute in your eyes to the ability of Napa wines to age? You know, I, I think that, um, you know, wines up in the, in the hills tend to, um, you know, hold on to a little bit more of their, their acid in, in these colder, um, you know, mountain regions. So, you know, even if, um, you know, and how mountain is very different than Spring Mountain. I think one of the really unique parts of Spring Mountain is the fact that, you know, and particularly this vineyard being up at the very top of that Mayakama Ridge, it gets a lot of west face or east facing, sorry. So it gets a lot of morning sun, a lot of midday sun. And so we're, we're quite a bit warmer than, than most of, of the other, you know, certainly the valley floor locations in the morning, but once you get into, you know, three or four in the afternoon, you know, the sun is kind of is heading west. And so the, the light tends to be a little bit less direct on the grapes. And, and we get these kind of cool breezes coming up and over uh, Spring Mountain, um, you know, from the Petaluma Gap. And so you really can feel the temperature sort of stabilize and start to cool down at four or five in the afternoon when other parts of Napa Valley are, are getting a lot more afternoon sun and you, you kind of have peak sun and peak temperature in a lot of locations. And, and so for Spring Mountain, I think that really helps the fruit to, to get sort of that hang time, be able to ripen later into the, to the fall without maybe as much pressure of, of dehydration and, and the heat impacts that you can get on, you know, really ripe fruit that's very close to being harvested. Um, is very fragile. And so when you get, you know, high heat and, and a lot of intense sun in the afternoon can really damage the fruit. And I think, you know, some of these locations up on Spring Mountain tend to be a little bit more um, insulated from that, which allows us to kind of get some pretty nice hang time. And I think this 07 really shows that, you know, vintage that was pretty warm. I mean, we had really warm temperatures in August, and then it kind of cooled down a bit. And then you know, September, October, we, you know, we had a really nice kind of warm fall. And so there's really no pressure to harvest. You know, there was no catastrophic rainstorm. There was just a really nice warm fall season. And so a lot of wines from that vintage show really, you know, big, rich, ripe fruit. And uh, this vineyard being on kind of a cooler spot, uh, cooler location, tended to, to hold on to its acid. You know, really, it got very rich and involved tannins, but it also held on to some of that varietal Cabernet character, literally, you know, that little bit of Bay Laurel, that, that you know, that kind of dark anise. Um, and so really kind of, to me, like it, it, it captured the essence of, of that 07 vintage and, and its kind of ability to hang out and, and develop a lot of these kind of nuances with Cabernet. And, um, 
you know, that's a, for me, I love how wines like Mountain Cabernets can age and kind of capture the essence of a year um, like 07. And, and, you know, for us to be able to enjoy it, you know, a decade and a half later, nearly it's, um, you know, it's one of the beautiful aspects of wine that uh, keeps me, keeps me engaged. Oh, thank you. That's, that's really great insight. And, and I agree. There's um, such a, a nice, uh, uh, a nice difference that, you know, with the dancing bear and with yours, there's, um, you know, two ways to approach the same, uh, uh, the same idea of how do we create, how do we create wines or how do we grow grapes in a way that they'll create wines that have the ability to age. And these are uh, two great examples. So, so thank you. Um, we're going to move on to uh, Michael Eddy, who's at the helm here at uh, Louis Martini. So, uh, first of all, Michael, thank you for letting us uh, use your space. Um, so, Michael, you're, as I mentioned earlier, the, the fourth winemaker in a almost 90 year history here at Martini family, and uh, the first winemaker to not uh, be a part of the Martini family, at least in blood. And you had quite a bit of uh, experience working with uh, Michael Martini, um, the third generation. So. Can you, uh, without telling the entire story myself, um, give us more insight into uh, the Martini family, uh, what it's like uh, to have carry that you know, massive responsibility and uh, a little bit about the Lot 1 2009 that we're tasting today. Yeah, happy to. And uh, Vincent, thank you. I, we're super honored to be able to host the event today um, in the winery that Louis M. Martini, our founder, built in 1933. So I could spend the entire rest of our time telling the story and it's fascinating, <laughs> but of course, um, that's not what we're here to do today. But it really is a fantastic story and I'm quite proud to be connected to it. You know, you asked the question about um, being the first non-Martini named, non-blood winemaker. Uh, I think that has two effects for me. One. Uh, it's a little intimidating, uh, but on the other hand, I also think it means I actually earned my place to be here crafting these wines as opposed to being handed it. So um, it, it, you know, it's it's a bit of a, a burden to carry at times because of it. It, it is a fantastic legacy, but um, also a great honor. Um, and you know, I think without telling the whole history, I think an important point in our history was in the early 2000s where we really started ushering in the new era. Uh, started planning and envisioning the renovated winery that uh, you guys are in today, uh, but also built our micro winery, Cellar 254, uh, which is where we now craft the lot number one that we're tasting today. And that was an important point because it really shifted our focus into many of our small lot wines that we now make there, but also gave us some more sophisticated tools to really more precisely extract, ferment, handle um, Cabernet. And it ultimately was our attempt to, to create our best expression of Napa Valley. Um, and again, gave us tremendous tools to do that, uh, designed by Mark Mar Mike Martini. And in 03, we began the lot number one program, and it is named in homage to uh, many of the wines that his father, Louis P., made, uh, where he made special selections, lot number three, lot number seven, et cetera. So named in homage to that. But... I think uh, as a distinguishing factor, particularly in this flight, um, you know, we, the Martini family has a strong connection to mountain sites and that plays a role in a number of wines that we make. Uh, Louis M purchased our Monteroso vineyard in 1938, just five years after he built his winery, uh, which is a fairly well-known vineyard and pretty remarkable in its own right. But his son, Louis P., uh, for a number of years, bottled California Mountain Cabernet, California Mountain Barbera. So this connection to mountain sites is really, really important. Um, but our lot number one actually isn't exclusively from mountain sites. And so that's a little bit of a counterpoint from our previous two wines. And in fact, uh, our previous two wines were site focused. And while we do have site focused wines in our Crown Cabernet collection today, lot one is really about using the different AVAs and sites within Napa Valley to craft a consistent fingerprint of what we think is the house style, which I would describe as, you know, when I envision lot number one, it is about displaying the richness, the density, the boldness of Cabernet Sauvignon, but with a decided measure of elegance and refinement. Um, and we talk a lot about how important sight is. It definitely is. But I think sometimes in doing so, we undermine the fact that what you do in the winery really is quite important and can have a, have a huge impact. Um, 
And, and so the, the micro winery does definitely put a fingerprint on the style and gives us the ability to really add that measure of elegance and roundness. Uh, you asked about 09. And I, for me, when I look back at vintages, there are two perspectives I have. I have perspective on the wines themselves, but there's also the experience as a winemaker. Um, and I like to think of 09 as kind of the last days of innocence to some degree because, uh, and I'm sure Elizabeth will talk about this. I don't want to steal her thunder, but 10 and 11 were really tough vintages. Um, I had had some challenging vintages, but those two changed my definition of what challenging was. Um, and so in 09, there were some challenges. We had a little bit of rain in October, uh, certainly not devastating. It was a moderately cool year, but I think it also had some hallmarks of really good vintages for ageability in the sense that there weren't a lot of extremes in 2009. Um, so the number of days we had over 100 degrees was relatively small. Um, so you had this kind of extended uh, patience trying kind of vintage. Um, but really, I hadn't learned, honestly, what I think of as one of my biggest learnings and perspectives as a winemaker, because I do think those hard vintages are the ones that teach you the most, quite frankly, as a winemaker. Um, and I stressed a lot about that rain. And, you know, in the press, I think in particular, it's often said that, oh, it's the people who had patience that benefited. But there are that those hard vintages teach you that that's actually not always the case, um, that sometimes you don't recover from a very heavy rain. Uh, and in 11, that was, was definitely the case. Um, and I think it also taught me to pay attention to the whole vintage as it's developing, because in these cool years, you really have to think about exposure, you have to think about crop level. And 2009 was a decent sized crop. And so managing that appropriately was what enabled you then later in the season to achieve ripeness. So I could go on a lot more, um, but I don't know if you have any question, follow up questions about the vintage or the wine, Vincent. Uh, I, I do, but I'm actually going to save that for uh, a little bit later because I think we can um, uh, dig in a little bit more there. Uh, so we'll I'll hold that thought for the moment um, and tag in uh, Elizabeth. So very excited to, to have you and your experience and hear your perspective on um, you know, working within primarily a, a subregion of Napa versus um, uh, working uh, across the valley. Uh, but before we get into that, can you tell us a little bit about um, yourself, how you got in, um, how you came to wine? You know, it's my understanding you had a, uh, you were on a, um, on a sciences track before uh, kind of being diverted or coaxed into wine, as many of us are, with uh, a glass of some pretty special Bordeaux, and uh, kind of the rest is history from there. So tell us a bit about yourself. Um, how you came to Chimney Rock and in your role and responsibility entering and now where you're at today. Absolutely. Um, it's an honor to be here with this cool panel and fun to be on a panel with Michael and Sam, who I went to Davis with. Uh, so <laughs> it, it all comes full circle. Um, so yeah, so I was on a pre-med track. I went to undergrad at Vassar and my plan was to be a, a physician and moved to New York City right after college and caught the the wine bug pretty seriously, fell in love with Cabernet specifically. I knew that Cab was gonna be my grape and um, that made me apply to UC Davis and pack my bags and do a you know, complete 180. And uh, in 1999, my last year at Davis, I landed an internship at Chimney Rock. Um, so it was my second internship in the wine business. And right then and there, I fell in love with the vineyards. Um, and uh, when I graduated, went off and worked at Napa Wine Company for a couple of years. And luckily, and this is kind of the, the circle of life, the assistant winemaker at Chimney Rock, who was a good friend of mine, Lila Bacchus, decided she was bored with wine and wanted to become a physician. So she now delivers babies in Chicago. And um, I got to come back as assistant winemaker. And I've been there for 20 years now. So um, it's an amazing little property. It's owned by the Trilado family. Uh, and we are exclusively dedicated to producing Stag's Leap District breads. We have about 105 acres um, in Stag's Leap District, mostly planted to Cabernet. We have a little Merlot, some Cab Franc, a little Petit Bordeaux, Malbec, and a 
a legendary secret row of Fiano on site as well. Um, and we're going to talk about that later. Oh yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, amazing piece of property, really um, diverse and kind of microclimates and soils. You know, we've got a few hillsides, real topographical uh, distinctions, and the north end's a little closer to the Palisades of the Stag's Leap, so slightly warmer site. Um, and then the south end, which is where Tomahawk hails from, which we're going to be tasting, um, is a much cooler spot. It's the coolest spot on the ranch, actually. So I, I chose um, uh, a cool vintage to talk about um, because, you know, Napa Valley is so fortunate. We have these, these vintages that are just, I almost call them lazy winemaker vintages, right? We don't have to think much. Um, there are no lazy winemakers, that's kind of an oxymoron, but um, I think winemakers develop an affection for those vintages where we really have to sweat it, right? There's this inbred, you know, ingrained memory of what you had to do to make great wine. In 2010, my nickname for that vintage is Training Wheels for 11, which it was. Um, super rainy winter, we got rain all the way into May. So one of those years where you're really thinking about cover crop, um, you're really thinking about leafing um, crop load because as the season developed, we just knew it was super, super cool. Um, and we had a couple of heat spikes, I think in the early summer and then a cool down again. And we're really kind of scratching our heads um, on, wow, you know. And then we had this crazy heat spike, which, Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I want to say it was like August 24th or August 26th, where we got to 113 degrees um, in Stag's Leap District. I remember looking at the weather station and just being horrified. Um, so these extremes, right? Cool and then heat. Um, but yet, I think it's been one of those vintages that has really surprised me in its ageability. Um, it really is, it's just, um, I, I have a fondness for cool years. So, um, and I think of that decade, you have five, six, and 10 probably were the coolest vintages. Um, 2000 was probably a little cool as well. Um, and, and those have all aged um, remarkably well, and I really enjoy them. So um, this was the fifth vintage that we produced, Tomahawk Vineyard. Um, and this vineyard was actually planted by the Trilados when they bought the property in the early 2000s. And um, I call this vineyard our child prodigy. It's the very south end of the estate, very rocky soils, um, super stressed vines. And it was just one of those vineyards that from the get go, we knew was going to be special. And sometimes, you know, when you plant a vineyard, if you get your rootstock and your clones and your spacing just right, um, you, you have that good fortune. Some vineyards take a little bit longer they go through that awkward uh, teenage, you know, period that Sam referred to, but Tomahawk was always a child prodigy and first vintage was 2006 and um, we've continued to make it and it is probably one of our more, most well-known single vineyards. We do about seven single vineyard calves at Chimney Rock, as well as an estate calf, which blends all of those blocks together. No, it, it's a beautiful wine. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. And um, really, um, uh, as you said, uh, it really shows, uh, I think, the vintage and the coolness of the site and that more of the, the non um, the non fruit or those like cool herbal like menthol character um, really, uh, really shows out. And it, it's like refreshing to drink, I think, uh, for that reason. Um, I, I, I want to stick with you and ask you uh, a follow up question. And that um, since you are working primarily with Stag's Leap District Fruit, um, what in your opinion about that subregion within the kind of Eastern, Southeastern pocket of Napa contributes to the ability uh, of wines from that region to age? Yeah, so we're, Stag's Leap District obviously nestled along the Southeast um, portion of Napa, it's kind of known as the valley within a valley, right? Because there's this low set of, um, lying hills across, just across the way um, to the west. 
And that creates this kind of funnel effect of winds from the San Pablo Bay. So we have this kind of extra cooling air conditioner um, that, that helps us really preserve acidity in that corner. Um, and you've got this yin and yang of the heat from the Palisades, which really helps your tannins ripen beautifully, but holding on to acidity. We stay a little cooler in the mornings and we cool down a little sooner. And it's interesting when you walk our estate, which is about a half a mile long, um, you can actually feel the change. Like as you walk halfway through the property, suddenly you feel the change and Tomahawk is at the cooler end. Um, so you're seeing a cool site for Cabernet in a cool vintage. And I, I couldn't agree more. You're seeing a lot of those um, characters of um, cooler climate, right? Um, dried herbs and a little bit of mint, which is such a beautiful um, characteristic, I think, of Cabernet's typicity. Um, but I think the acidity is really what keeps that freshness. And um, I think the acid is, is, is the secret in Stag's Leap, as well as the texture of the tannins. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And you know, certainly no um, uh, stranger to success on a global level with uh, you know, a Stag's Leap wine winning the Judgment of Paris uh, in 1976. Uh, uh, definitely a, a, a region to be uh, a region to be looking out for. Uh, going forward, um, if people aren't already, uh, I want to circle back to uh, to Bruce. Um, you had alluded to uh, changes happening in the valley uh, during the 2000s, particularly when you made the 2004 Dancing Bear. Uh, given, I mean, given your just incredibly extensive uh, tenure in the valley, can you talk to us a little bit about what was happening in the 80s and 90s leading up to? Uh, this decade and how you feel that impacted the wines being produced from you know, from the 2000s. It's a kind of interesting uh, to kind of live through this time, but in the 80s, uh, you know, we're pre phylloxera so the, the the vineyards were different. You know, the vine spacing was eight by twelve or 454 vines per acre. Uh, and so you're just really working with a raw product than what we're working with today uh, in that, in terms of, you know, the old AXR1 rootstock or St. George rootstock, the irrigation requirements are very different. How the canopy was, is trained today versus uh, what some people would call nicely a California sprawl, it's very different. So you, you have really, the fruit is very different uh, and then also we're learning a lot of how things are going, you know, a lot of our vineyards are planted in the late seventies. And so, you know, they're under 10 years old or just moving to 10 years old. So we're working with that. Uh, and then you had the, when we started seeing phylloxera in the nineties, I think the nineties were one of the most challenging decades to make wine because you had vineyards kind of succumbing to phylloxera and so you're sorting through what vines are healthy and what vines weren't. And then you also had a lot of young vines kind of coming up and that helped set us up as, you know, for us Dancing Bear Ranch with young vineyards, how to manage young vineyards to uh, have really nice quality to uh, balance the kind of the, the canopy with the root system, the fruit load with the age of the vine. And so that was really a, a learning lesson that we learned from the 90s, but going from uh, the old AXR vines to what we have today is just really different. And that made us kind of rethink that we have a whole uh, kind of raw product that we need to relearn how we uh, you know, do fermentations in the, in the winery. And we've taken to different regions of the valley have kind of a different protocol for uh, red wine fermentations or hillside up valley is going to be different than our hillsides down valley. Uh, and so you, we've kind of learned that. And I think uh, whereas pre phylloxera it was, you know, a lot of our fruit came from the valley floor, a lot of kind of uh, is subtle differences than what we see today. So uh, it's exciting times in the 80s, uh, but I think phylloxera was uh, a really fast forward to jump the wine quality uh, to where we are today. Some of the, the the phylox pre phylloxera wines are truly beautiful and aging quite gracefully. Uh, and, and, but also, you know, you have different vines and kind of a different climate than what we have today. So a lot of different changes 
that happened over that, you know, those 1990s uh, to get to where we are today. And I think it's those learning lessons where the winemakers really took what happened and then apply them to the new vintages, working with new rootstocks, new trellis systems, uh, kind of new technology to understand what works and what doesn't work. And that's really helped get the quality of all Napa Valley wines where they are today, whereas uh, maybe it's a little bit more divergent uh, in the uh, 70s and 80s. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, there's definitely, uh, I, I, I think a really pivotal point and just so happens to be in the 2000, 2001, as you mentioned, uh, for, for the Valley from a viticulture, from a winemaking perspective. And I think other outside pressures uh, on a consumer side that we won't, won't really have time to jump into today. But um, I want to jump to Sam and, uh, and, and backtrack to the 2004 vintage. So Sam, if, if you can remember, so can you contrast the 2004 vintage for you, whereas you know, Bruce is saying they harvested the first week of September, uh, what was the case for yourself being on you know, the cooler side of the valley, if you will, or being high atop Spring Mountain? And then can you comment on some of the overall style you felt was in the valley, you know, working with your dad? Uh, in the 80s and 90s and how you saw that as you were uh, taking over the winemaking at Terra Valentine and how that evolved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the 04 vintage, I, I really, I remember being sort of um, having this, this heat spell kind of in the fall that, that really kind of launched everything to, to a ripeness level where you kind of, where a lot of vineyards were forced to pick. You know, there wasn't, um, there was so much heat, there was shrivel happening. And so, there, I, I, I kind of just feel like that vintage felt more, um, a little bit more intense, like a little bit more of like, okay, you know, okay, we got to go out there and get this fruit before it dehydrates too much. And <clears throat> I felt like overall, you know, in that vintage like that, you don't necessarily get the hang time to, to get the evolution of tannin and flavor like you do in 07. And that was a difference, the primary difference for me. I mean, I felt like 04 was a great vintage as well. I really, um, but it was, it was a little more site specific. You know, I felt there's a little more variation in whether, you, how, how ripe was your fruit when that heat wave hit and forced you to pick? And if your fruit was still fairly green and you had to pick, then, you know, you, you might've had some unresolved tannin issues, but 07 was, a, you know, I, I would feel like just overall a little bit um, easier vintage, you know, you kind of, you, you, the weather let you uh, choose when to, to harvest rather than being pressured into it by a heat event or a rain event. Um, but uh, yeah, so going, you know, going back, it was a really interesting, you know, starting at Terra Valentine in, in 99 after going to UC Davis and, you know, growing up in the Valley. And I feel like there was a, you know, in the, in the 80s and, and even into the 90s, there was kind of a, a still a, a somewhat of a disconnect between the vineyard and the winery. And I think even in my dad's area, particularly in the 70s, his winemaking began when the grapes showed up on the crush pad. And, um, and I think the, the 2000s really began that, that, or, or fast forwarded the evolution of the winemakers getting out into the vineyard more. And rather than, even at UC Davis, there were still the people studying grape growing and the people studying winemaking. It was like two kind of separate things. And, but we were all going, well, wait, I wanna know how to grow grapes. Like I wanna know the wine growing and the winemaking. And so there began to be a lot more interplay, I think. And, and I think, you know, for me, starting my career in the beginning of the 2000s, you know, it really happened out in the vineyard. And, you know, when I started at Terra Valentine, we had a, a 35 acre vineyard, the Wordle Vineyard up on Spring Mountain. I was planted by Walt and Roy Raymond. And uh, it was a, this great vineyard, you know, coming into maybe its 10th year production. And prior to us starting, it had been picked in one day. They would go up, pick all 35 acres in one day and, and send it out to the wineries. And in 99, we went in there and go, wow, like this is, this is a very diverse vineyard. And we picked over six weeks in about 25 different lots of Cabernet. Even though it's the same clone and same rootstock, there's such a diversity of, of ripening and, and flavor profiles. And um, so I think that attention into to the vineyards, the site-specific winemaking that began out there in the vineyard really took off in the early 2000s. That's, uh, uh, that's, that's a great segue. Thank you, Sam. Um, because Michael, I want to pose the next question to you in that 
um, you know, you have had experience here at Martini working with uh, one of the most kind of legendary single vineyards uh, in California. Um, can you expand a little bit about on how the conversation of ageability came up while working with Michael? How important was it to the family then? How important is that conversation now? Because, you know, we exist in a in an age where a lot of wine is consumed very quickly after purchase. So, you know, what is the conversation of ageability uh, for you and how is how does that fit into winemaking? Yeah, good question. And um, I think there are a lot of facets to this question when we talk ageability. And briefly, I want to touch on something that is like really not sexy and not intellectually that interesting and technical, but very important, I think, for people to appreciate. I won't go on and on about it. But um, one of the most important things for ageability is getting a wine in the bottle with the proper closure, a well-manufactured, well-selected closure with appropriate or low O2 levels and consistently doing that on a bottling line. And the fact is, as an industry, as we've gotten technically better and better at doing that, almost all wines have got more ageable, quite frankly. Um, so it's a really fundamental factor um, and something you can master, but something the industry, I think, over the last couple of decades has definitely gotten better and better at, more and more precise. When we talk about wines and ageability, I think you know, maybe cliche, but balance is really important. Balance both in the vineyard, meaning between the canopy and the fruit, as well as the elements of the wine. And yes, ageability is certainly an important thing, but I think one of the things I have learned, particularly when I taste very old vintages, like some of the vintages that Louis P made, is that ageability can come in different styles. Uh, you, when I've tasted some of Louis P's wines, we're talking about 12 and a half percent alcohol. Um, very different than the lot one that you're tasting today at 15.2 alcohol. So fundamentally, style-wise, ripeness-wise, um, very, very different styles, but I think all very ageable because they have a sense of balance. Um, and one of the ways we accomplish that in lot one is, is kind of combining these mountain sites with more valley floor sites and being able to adjust that kind of ratio in different vintages. So the mountain sites that we work with typically give us a lot of power, tannin structure, density, whereas the, the bench or valley floor sites tend to have a little bit more elegance and refinement. Um, and depending upon the vintage, we're able to kind of adjust the, the blend because this is uh, blended very stringently. We typically, put a third of the wine that we have crafted into the final blend. Um, and this, this vintage, the 09 that you're tasting includes Oakville, Stag's Leap, um, Pritchard Hill, and then uh, what we call the Silverado Bench, kind of northeast of the town of Napa. And so each of those are bringing in different elements that then during the blending process, um, I'm adjusting to really give what I believe is the expression of, of lot number one. But Mike and I talked a lot about aging and I'll be honest, we had some areas in which we didn't fully agree. Um, he had wines that he liked to quite frankly, age a lot in barrel. Um, and to me, there was a, a, in some styles, particularly as we move towards riper uh, fruit, where there was a loss of vitality with that extended aging in barrel and in uh, bottle after that long barrel aging. And to carry on the conversation with both Sam and Bruce, I think for me, my first vintage at a winery was 97. And I think those late 90s and into this decade, we're talking about there was a shift of paradigms and breaking of paradigms. And 97 broke some paradigms in the sense that it was a very large crop, but very ripe and very highly critically acclaimed. Um, and it really started to break down this notion that high quality came from vintages with low crop levels. I think it also was a starting to redefine what ripe meant. And to Bruce's discussion about replanting after phylloxera, we were having cleaner and cleaner material go into vineyards. So we had healthier and healthier vineyard blocks that were able to achieve ripeness levels that virus older blocks were not able to achieve. So it really that, that late nineties into the two thousands was a redefining of what ripe meant of what balance was. And as we got better at capturing that in the bottle, it allowed us new styles 
in the bottle that could really age in a way that maybe we wouldn't have anticipated a couple decades ago. Michael, uh, one one last follow up because I know we're we're running just short on um, uh, towards the end of the panel. Um, you mentioned two thousand and three in uh, just in that in that in that clip there, and we actually had a question come up uh, from Chris Blanchard about the two thousand and three vintage. Um, can you talk really quickly? You know, give us your uh, elevator spiel on two thousand and three, and the general characteristics of that year. And then maybe close us out and talk about, you know, how this decade, uh, why this decade of wine from Napa Valley has the ability to age and what someone can expect generally from the wines today, perhaps that aren't sitting here with these four wines in front of us. Yeah, so 03, I'm going to I'm going to partially defer to some of my colleagues. So in 03, I was actually not working in Napa Valley. However, it was the first vintage of lot number one that we ever produced. Um, and and so that's part of my perspective on Napa from being very close to a wine and understanding it. So I'm going to qualify it a little bit. Uh, and, and actually, in the early days of lot number one, it was much more heavily mountain based. Uh, so we were working with uh, Diamond Mountain, Spring Mountain, uh, Howl Mountain Stagecoach, et cetera. Um, and so those wine, that, that vintage, first one through the micro winery, um, had a lot of power, a lot of density. Um, and I don't know how much of that was really impacted by the, uh, the micro winer and our ability to get some refinement, but it was a fairly muscular vintage, that vintage of lot one, um, but not with an aggressive edge. So, you know, I, I often think of mountain sites as having the potential, particularly when we're talking about a place like Howl Mountain to have very firm, aggressive might not be the word, but powerful muscular tannins, um, and O3, in uh, with lot one did not display that um, from my perspective. But again, I was uh, working with that wine after it was crafted. So I don't have a lot of, you know, direct perspective on how the wines were crafted and evolved necessarily. Sure, thank you. Uh, that question came up, um, Sam, while you were speaking uh, a little bit about um, your history. So can you touch on that? I know that was still pretty early on in Terra Valentine for you, but anything you noticed from 2003 and any thoughts on, you know, this decade in terms of how, how it's showing today versus some of those, you know, wines 10 or 15 years after bottling that you had that perhaps your father made or other winemakers in the Valley made when you were coming up? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that the 03 vintage, um, has has really not held on as well as as some of its predecessors and and I don't you know again it, it's so um, site specific and and winery um, specific that it you know it is so kind of uh, it's hard to generalize with any of these vintages but um, you know for me I felt like the 03 vintage was, was a little bit um, you know riper less tannic than the, the like for me the 02 was was a little bit more you know, kind of chewy and dense and structured, which, you know, for, for our mountain wines tend to kind of bode well for aging. But um, the 03, I felt like, you know, just overall didn't quite hold together as well. Um, and, you know, I, I'm hard to really pinpoint exactly why. Absolutely. Well, thank you so, all of you so much again for uh, your time. I know, uh, especially with the 80 degree weather we're experiencing and vineyards going through bud break, it seems like the season is already upon us. So thank you for taking time uh, out of your day to join us, uh, to all of our guests virtually and afar, uh, and to our, our in-person audience here. Um, thank you all as well, again, for supporting the Valley, especially with all the challenges we've had uh, and over the past uh, couple of vintages. Um, just a, a couple of housekeeping notes, uh, all of the wines, uh, that we talked through today are available uh, through the Sotheby's auction uh, on the Napa Valley Vintners and Premier Napa Valley uh, website. So you can go and bid on those as well as other wines from this decade. Um, so again, thank you very much uh, for your time and we hope to see you uh, in person next year for Premier Napa Valley.